Cheers, guys. Epix 911, welcome to the Saturday, May 27th, 2017 edition of VR News. A couple of quick things I want to talk about, and then we'll jump into the news. First, kind of the release schedule. So typically, when I was on the West Coast, 3, 4 p.m. is when I started. It would take three to eight hours to finish a video, which would leave me with enough time to still get enough sleep for work. Now, I don't have work right now. I'm focusing on YouTube, but I like that schedule because it gives me enough time within kind of my waking hours that I'm not too tired. The problem with it is news could break when I've already uploaded or I'm editing. If it's really important though, I'll just do an addendum video. Otherwise, I'll roll it into the next day's news. The next thing, when you can expect Quick Look series games or the recap series to return. Well, the Quick Look, still a couple of weeks away. I wanna measure twice, cut once, and really think about the green screen space and where I put the sensors for VR. Still a couple of weeks away for that. But the recap series, that's going to start back up within the next couple of days. I believe the last one I did was the last week of April. So that gives us pretty much the month of May to talk about VR releases during the last four weeks. So like I said, expect that in the next couple of days. All right, let's jump into the news. Start with the game Sublevel Zero. Now, Sublevel Zero is a Descent style game. If you're not familiar with that, look it up. I believe GOG has a, a version of it on offer, kind of modernized. It was a good game for its time and it's aged pretty well. Six degree of freedom, you know, flying a spaceship in underground labyrinths, bases, installations, etc., shooting other ships and security mounted weapon platforms, etc. Well, they have been asked to create a VR game for this for months because it's really well suited to that. The developers, SigTrap Games, announcing today that there will be VR versions for the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive of this game July 13th. So, not bad. Uh, probably something I'll check out. I love the original Descent. Haven't really played anything like it since. It'll be interesting to see how they pull it off. So again, July 13th for that. And it'll be called Sublevel Zero Redux. Next news story, another game, this one, Kairi Sai Million Arthur VR. We talked about this game from Square Enix a couple of months ago. It's finally launched, and a couple of things a little strange about it. The first, a little odd considering we just talked about this yesterday, it's another Japan-only release, which is unfortunate because it's a JRPG card battler game, which would probably do pretty well around the rest of the world. You know, we're also into card battling games. Magic the Gathering is still very popular in North America, for example. So a little bit strange, that one. Even stranger, though, is the fact that it's a Vive exclusive. You heard me right. Vive exclusive. Coming from the company that has often criticized others for releasing exclusive games, i.e. Oculus, Sony, etc. So probably not as bad because it's Japan only, but still kind of goes against what they've been saying for the last uh, year plus. Now, hopefully this gets released globally after a period of time. Maybe it's just because of localization efforts, etc. And whatever that exclusivity agreement is, Hopefully that runs out at around the same time. All right, next news piece. Talking about the Uncanny Valley. This is uh, an Upload VR article, Why Soul Machines Made an AI Baby. Now, Soul Machine Machines is a company that specializes in artificial intelligence and interacting with digital avatars made with that AI technology. The one here, the AI baby, kind of probably better stated, it's an AI toddler, is kind of cool. Now, according to them, 10 to 15% of the people who've watched it in action find it creepy. And Uncanny Valley basically means, for anyone who doesn't know, because humans, you know, unless, and some autism, uh, 
some people with autism have this issue reading facial expressions. It's a human ability. And we are pretty damn good at reading hundreds of very subtle facial expressions on fellow human beings. So when a digital human being comes along, it's pretty easy for us to root out that, hey, this is not a real human. And the reaction to that, for it to be Uncanny Valley, doesn't have to be creepy. It can just be, I can tell it's not human. That is what Uncanny Valley is. So with the AI baby, my reaction was more stuff just didn't feel right. There was a lot of things it nails. So watch the video. For example, that typical toddler, you know, uh, attention span of about two seconds, right? One second where you're trying to get the toddler's attention and the toddler's all over the place. Even halfway through, they can get bored. And this toddler exhibits that down to a T. It's the responses to good boy, good girl, you know, the, the praising that just seems off. It just doesn't seem right. And some of the other expressions that the AI toddler pulls that just don't feel right. And again, that's Uncanny Valley. Can't wait till we get to the point where it does pass muster and we are fooled. That is going to be an amazing time for gaming, RPGs, you name it, having artificial intelligence, non-player characters that feel as human as you or I. So check that video out. Very cool. Let me know if you find it creepy. What's your response to that? Now, the next story on the surface might seem a little sad. I don't see it that way. I see it as a very positive, hopeful video or story rather. It's from the Daily Mail. Uh, science section, and it concerns Augustin Zanoli. And he was an adrenaline junkie, left quadriplegic after a quadding accident. Uh, he's able to, through VR, still experience the adrenaline junkie rush. And he does this using VR, uh, an HMD, with flying drones. Drones that are capable of doing 100 miles an hour, 160 kilometers an hour with a first person seat to that, steering completely with the head. Now, of course, quadriplegic means no use of arms or legs, unlike an able-bodied person. Now, he's enjoying this so much, Augustine, that he's even contemplating joining a drone flying league. And it just goes to show you, this is the type of technology that quadriplegics three, four decades ago would never have dreamed would be possible, right? Yeah, they could read, they could watch TV, a movie, but technology has opened so much more. Being quadriplegic would still have a lot of negatives and a lot of hurdles, but at least it'll allow those with it to pursue hobbies, right? To pursue things. And I always said, even when I was a kid, you know, when your buddies and you, you get around and would you rather have this or that, you know, loss of your legs or loss of your arms? And for most of us, my friends had the same hobby. We would say legs because we want to use our arms to play musical instruments, video games, etc. Right. Uh, even though some hobbies, mountain biking definitely involve your legs. So it's nice to see technology answer that. And I think VR hasn't even scratched the surface on how it's going to be able to help people and level that playing field and that experience field of VR to everyone, able-bodied or otherwise. Next news story, spotting the difference, key distinctions between 360 degrees and VR. You would think after a year and a bit since the launch of all these devices, we wouldn't have to constantly explain the difference between 360 and VR. Even virtual reality websites on occasion use them interchangeably when they are so not interchangeable. You can experience 360 degree content with VR, but it's not VR. It's not a question of better or worse. It's something totally different. 360 degree can be experienced with an HMD or with a mouse and a flat monitor by rotating, but it's basically done on a pivot point. And if you're in a 360 degree video, 
you're being dragged along a linear path throughout which you can pivot and view your surroundings. Whereas in virtual reality, with room scale, you're free to go wherever the hell you want. You can interact. Again, the 360 being a lot more kind of static. So two different things. Love how the article points them out. Just hope people read it. <laughs> it's one of those things, you know, five, 10 years from now, people are still gonna use interchangeably. Next news story, Ink Flash, a website using virtual reality to allow people to look at and make book purchases, which, you know, and books is one of those things. It took a while for me to get to eBooks. And now that I am comfortable with eBooks, yeah, I can go back with physical books, absolutely. But the advantages with an eBook reader for me are so numerous now, uh, there'd almost be no reason for me to go back to physical books. So Ink Flash, that's their focus. It's the purchase of a book. People who want to get as close as possible to being able to hold a book, flip it over, look at the cover, look at the back, read the synopsis, etc. What I would love to see in VR, and we're gonna get there, is take it to that next level. I would love to read a book in VR. I'm not talking ebook reader, actual VR experience and read the book in it. And as I'm reading the book, have the environment and area around me reflect the genre, reflect exactly what I happen to be reading. You could make books so much more immersive and yet not ruin that key component of your own imagination because your own imagination probably more powerful than any GPU or VR simulation, you are gonna do a much better job in your mind of creating the characters, the environments, but it doesn't mean that that process can't be enhanced with a little help from VR. I would love to see that. Next up, the MSI VR backpack that we talked about, uh, I think about three, four weeks ago, or three, four weeks before I did my last video rather, uh, reviews coming out on that, uh, one such review on VR Source, they talked about the positives. Uh, you know, eliminating, having to trip over wires, uh, striking design, comfortable feel, unflinching performance, and then of course some negatives, like the constant need to connect to a monitor, mouse, and keyboard every time you boot the thing up. Not being able to use it with a Rift, because the Rift sensors require USB plugins, so that's pretty unfortunate. It'd be a lot more compelling for me having both Rift and Vive if I could use it for both. It's also priced like a gaming laptop, so you'll need to supply the mouse, keyboard, and monitor on top of that though. And just a quick reminder of the specs, uses a GTX 1070, Core i7-6820, so really the latest processor there, 16 gigs of DDR4, and half a terabyte, 512 gigabytes, SSD drive plus directional cooling. So it's certainly got the specs to power VR properly. You're just limited to the Vive and to the battery life of the backpack itself. Curious if anyone out there has got one of these. Any of you tried it uh, or more than tried it actually, like I said, own it or have borrowed it for extended periods. Love to hear from you. For me, it's always kind of been that interim step that I've just kind of acknowledged I'm gonna let pass by until wireless is here. So those of you who do use one, I'd love to hear from you. All right, guys, that is it for the news on this Saturday. Again, like I said, happy to be back. We'll start work on that gaming recap video over the next few days. Other than that, back here tomorrow for another edition of VR News. Guys, as always, cheers.